Kirsten nice. Gillibrand has represented the state of New York in the U.S. Senate since 2009. During her congressional tenure, she has been a tireless advocate for women, battling sexual assault and harassment in the military and on college campuses, fighting for equal pay, family leave, and affordable child care, and working to get more women elected to office across the nation. Gillibrand led the effort to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. She wrote the Stock Act, which made it illegal for members of Congress to financially benefit from inside information. And she won the fight to provide permanent health care and compensation to 9-11 first responders. Last but certainly not least, Gillibrand is a wife and the mother of two young sons, Theo and Henry, one of whom she famously went into labor with after 12 hours on the Senate floor. Please join me in welcoming Senator Gillibrand. Thank you. And please hang on to your amazing and pressing questions. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So I want to start off by asking you whether you are surprised to have found yourself at the absolute center of the national Me Too movement when the issues that have been hugely important to you, sexual assault and harassment in the military, equal pay, family leave, have been front and center you know, personally for years. I mean, is the nation just catching up to you? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I wanted to talk about the larger moment we're in a little bit, because I think it's so exciting. Um, you know, I never could have imagined uh, that we would have had the Women's March. I, I literally couldn't have imagined it. About six years ago, I started a political action committee called Off the Sidelines, asking women, number one, to vote, number two, to become advocates on the issues they care about, number three, to run for office, and if they didn't want to run, support a woman who shared your values to run. And I really felt like I was in the wilderness because I felt like the women's movement was dead. I really felt like women were not sort of owning their future when it come, came to politics, that they too often were saying, well, I, I, my vote doesn't matter, my voice doesn't matter, someone will do it. I don't want to run it for office because I don't like the rough and tumble of politics and I, 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 I'm sure someone will do the things that I want them to do. I'm sure they'll do the right things. And I thought, that that's not what's happening. In fact, we only had 18% of women in Congress. And I thought, we are moving in the wrong direction, not the right direction. It was the first year, in fact, that the percentage of women in Congress actually went down in like 20 or 30 years. So I thought, I, I need to create this call to action. I never could have guessed that it was the election of Donald Trump <laughs> that would have actually done that. And this, this call to action went out across the globe. And so women began to march. And the Women's March was men, women, children across the globe marching for what they cared about. And what was so powerful to me about that march at that moment was that it was intersectional. It actually didn't matter what you were marching for. You could march for Black Lives Matter, or you could march for women's reproductive freedom, or you could march for LGBTQ equality, or clean air, clean water. You just made your sign. And it didn't actually matter that, 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 that what your sign said and somebody else said. You were just there. And it just mattered that you were willing to make a sign and willing to stand up for what you cared about. And so people marched. And that excitement and that determination and that willingness to speak out hasn't stopped at all. And so it's, it's, it's being shown across the board. It's shown in the number of people who show up to your town halls uh, across the country with uh, Indivisible and other apps and other you know, groups that are trying to uh, magnify that. You've got people who are willing to speak out through letters to the editor, through social media, uh, through posting on Facebook, people willing to um, be heard in Congress. Me Too is very much part of that, that women are now saying, I'm going to tell my story. Uh, and I'm going to really talk about things that I would have never talked about because I want to be able to strengthen the ability of the next woman to tell her story. Uh, and what you're also seeing is women are running for office. Uh, you, got, you have, in Texas alone, you have over two dozen women running for Congress. A couple of them are in this room right now. I just met one, got her card. Another one over there. Like, you have women running for Congress uh, in record numbers in this state, in, in record numbers in the country. Over 400 women are running for Congress across the country right now. Um, Emily's List says they'd normally have maybe 1,000 women they're training in the pipeline. pipeline. They have over 20,000 women in the pipeline. Like, it's crazy exciting. And so I think this, this moment is about women's voices. And I think the Me Too moment is about women's voices, and men too to be heard in some of the worst things that have happened to them and to get that measure of justice. The Me Too movement, though, will not be done with its work until every woman can come forward, even women in low-wage jobs, women who cannot speak out, don't have a, a famous boss, or don't have the um, a certainty that they won't be fired or lose their ability to earn money for their families if they come out. So whether it's a woman working on a farm or a woman working in, in service industries as a, as a waitress or in a hotel, 
we need to be able to get to the point where all those women can get justice. Right. Well, I want to talk about how you get to a point where you can tell those stories. You know, obviously there have been all these stories about sexual misconduct in Congress and state legislatures. You've experienced this firsthand. The President of the United States himself harassed you in what many people saw as a sexually suggestive way uh, on Twitter. I mean, how do we root this out at, at the levels of our own workplaces when this is something that's permeating in the highest levels of government? So we have to keep fighting back and calling it out and, and having the courage to do it. And, and everyone has a Me Too story. Everyone has had someone, if not themselves, someone they're close to, someone they've seen. Tell those stories. Uh, the more we speak out, the more we normalize the ability to speak truth to power, the more empowered we become. And I, I just want to comment on one thing that happened over the weekend, because um, this is nonpartisan, right? This yeah. is nonpartisan. Completely. So the CPAC conference was this weekend, which is the, the conservative PAC where a lot of Republicans gather and uh, the president. One of, oh, they had, they had a women's panel on the Me Too movement, OK? And that women's panel offered different perspectives on what Me Too means for women and what they thought. But one woman on the panel, in the last question asked, said, because the question was, what's making you really angry? What's the one thing you just can't tolerate? What's the one thing that's upsetting you deeply? And she said, I don't believe the Republican Party is calling out their own. I don't think we are speaking truth to power with our president, who was accused over a dozen times of sexual harassment and sexual assault. We aren't policing ourselves in Congress. We aren't holding ourselves accountable, and we should be, because this movement and moment is for all of us. And she was literally escorted out of the conference for saying those words. Mm -hmm. So, so, so what, I, what I hope is happening is the courage of that one woman is going to be replicated. And, and another woman came up to her, was also on the panel at the end, and said, you were, that, that took courage. Now, she didn't, wasn't prepared to say that publicly at the panel at the time, but the fact that she recognized that as courage means we're moving forward. It means there will come a time when every woman and girl can speak out, no matter who she is, no matter what place it is and not have to fear for retaliation. And that's why I work on legislation in sexual assault in the military, sexual assault on college campuses, ending the harassment laws in Congress that are overwhelmingly built to protect harassers and predators. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned courage. And I want to talk about something that obviously um, was a line in the sand that you had to draw. You've said that women basically need to decide where their point is, their line in the sand is, and that they need to be able to speak firmly about the actions of their peers, their friends, their colleagues. Obviously, you were the first uh, member of Congress to call on Senator Franken to resign, somebody who had been your squash partner. Uh, you made comments a few weeks later uh, on Bill Clinton saying you would have basically said the same thing if he'd been in office and you'd been in office at the same time. How, what was that like for you personally to have to say those things about people who you'd considered or still consider your friends and your peers? Um, well, I wasn't the first member of Congress. Other members had already done that, uh, maybe the first uh, Democratic Democrat, senator. Right. Um, but. Um, it's hard. I mean, speaking hard truths is hard, especially when you care about somebody, especially when you like someone, especially when they're doing a great job in their day job. Like, that's, that is the challenge we have in all these platforms. You know, when you're talking about sexual assault in the military, um, the, the person they are protecting is usually great at their day job. They're a great, you know, service member and a great shooter and all these, maybe several tours of duty. But when you're when you're, when you're raping your fellow service members or harassing them or assaulting them, you are toxic to that unit. And you need to have accountability. You need, trans, you need transparency and accountability. And that's why you have to change the laws in the military. Um, with Senator Franken, it was just, it was too much. It was enough was enough. It was eight credible allegations of harassment and groping. And I, I have a young son. I have two sons. I have a 14-year-old and a 9-year-old. And if I stayed silent, I could not be a good mother. I could not be a good leader in this space of trying to give voices to women. Because at the end of the day, is the question is, fundamentally, do we value women? And if the answer is no, then that is not good enough. Like, we have to value women. And that's why I, I had to speak out. And I, I, I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't stay silent. And you spoke about this a little bit on the 60 Minutes interview that you did. Um, but there were questions about you know, whether Franken received due process or not. Is this even an environment where due process is an appropriate conversation? Yeah, he's entitled to whatever due process he wants. That's his decision. He can stick out his ethics committee. He could sue his accusers. He can do anything he wants. That's his choice. But he's not entitled to my silence. And speaking out on behalf of those eight women and, and saying I believe them is my choice. 
that's my decision. And if I can't say how I feel and if I choose to stay silent, then I, I am not being a good mother. I need, and I'm not being a good senator because I need to be able to tell my 14-year-old son it's not okay. You know, yes, there's a big difference between what President Trump's accused of and what Roy Moore was accused of and what Al Franken was accused of. All different things. But uh, I have to be able to tell Theo it's not okay. You can't grab a woman here and you can't grab a woman here and you can't grab a woman there. None of it is okay. Yes. <laughs> You, you cannot grab a woman without their consent. You can't try to kiss them without their consent. You, none of this is OK. And if we are trying to make excuses for people that we know and love, that's the wrong conversation. Well, I want to talk about your unprecedented work to root out sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military, and mostly to hear what it is like as a woman trying to make these changes in an industry, in a, a culture that is still very uh, testosterone dominant. Mm. So the question is, what's it like to serve with a bunch of men? Or what's it like to, <laughs> yeah, right. Or that. We can just talk about Congress. No, uh, what were you asking? Uh, I want to know what it's like going up against an institution like the military to oh, root out yeah. sexual assault and harassment. Yes. So uh, it is challenging because they don't want to change. Um, I respect uh, so deeply the service of our men and women. I respect that sacrifice they make every day. But our members of the military deserve a military justice system that's worthy of that sacrifice. And that is what they don't have today. They do not have the ability to get justice. They don't have the ability to have transparency and accountability. Uh, and it's wrong. I mean, it's absolutely wrong. Because today in the military, the decisions are made entirely by commanders who aren't lawyers, who aren't trained, who may have biases. And it shows in their work product. It shows. I mean, the number of cases that are moving forward to trial are going down. The number of convictions are going down, but you still have the same prevalence rate. You had 15,000 cases of sexual assault uh, and, and um, unwanted sexual contact and rape in the military last year. A lot of these cases stemming from Texas, correct? S Lackland Six, Air Force 6, Base. 6,000 reported, 4,000 openly. And you know how many people are retaliated against because they report? 59%. It's barely budged. It was 62% the year before and 62% the year before that. That's not budging, and that's entirely in the commander's purview. Stop retaliating against people who come forward with sexual assault. Like, stop it. Give them, move these cases forward. And so my solution is, which is based on what the survivors have said, is let the decision be made by trained military prosecutors, somebody who knows what to do, whose goal is to get rid of predators and not keep the service members that they like better, uh, who might be better at their day job. It's not the point of criminal justice to uh, choose based on things other than, is there evidence that a crime has been committed? And so it needs to be professionalized, and it needs to be taken out of the chain of command. So your proposed Military Justice Improvement Act, which you're speaking out about, is an area where you've gotten to work uh, quite closely and on the same side of the issue with someone you probably disagree with on many other issues, and that's our Texas Senator, Ted Cruz. Um, he's one of just a few Republicans who are supporting it. I want to know if the two of you are personal friends, family friends. What's your relationship like with Ted Cruz? We are colleagues. <laughs> uh, we are colleagues. Um, but I have invited Ted over to my house before. What uh, was that like? It was lovely. Uh, he came with his wife and beautiful two daughters. And his daughters were as charming and as lovely as any young girls could be. Uh, and his wife was also super nice. So I try to work with everyone in the Senate. I always try to work across the aisle, try to start every piece of legislation with a good idea to build bipartisan support from that perspective. Even your other Senator Cornyn is on my bill to end sexual harassment uh, in Congress. And so uh, that is a common sense bipartisan bill that I cannot believe we haven't voted on yet. It's literally already passed the House. And if I was just to tell you how terrible it is, if you are harassed by your boss, uh, a member of Congress in the House or Senate today, you might be looking at a three-month process just to report. A month of mandatory counseling, a month of mandatory mediation, followed by a month of cooling off, and then you're allowed to actually report that you've been harassed. So what our bill will do is change that, and most importantly, if you are harassed by a member of Congress, it ends the taxpayer paid uh, settlements. It just ends it. If you, if you are um, uh, found to have been harassing someone on your staff and, and you have a, um, a settlement, you have to pay it out of your own money. Mm -hmm. 
So it is a good bill. It's common sense. We need it voted on, and there's no excuse not to get it done. Well, I want to talk in light of Florida uh, about your personal transition a decade old now on an issue that's really front and center across the nation, questions around gun rights, gun control. You know, you famously grew up hunting in upstate New York, kept two guns under your bed, you came into office with an A rating from the NRA. How did your personal thinking evolve, and do you expect other political evolutions in light of all the teenagers, kids standing up today? I do, and I can tell you exactly. So um, when I was a House member, I supported the Second Amendment and really just looked at the issue through the lens of my constituents, which was really focused on hunting, just having the Second Amendment, having hunters' rights. And when I got appointed to the U.S. Senate, um, I knew I had to figure this out because uh, there were big issues in my state that I did not spend enough time focused on. And so it happened nine years ago when I went down to Brooklyn and I met with a, a parent uh, who lost their daughter. Her name was Nyasia, Nyasia Pryor Yard. And she was killed by a stray bullet while she was just at a party with her friends. And I met their, her classmates. I met her whole class. And these young people came up to me and said, you need to help us. We don't want to die. We need to do something to end gun violence. We don't want to hear excuses. We want you to do something. And that's exactly what's happening right now. The fact that you've got a girl like Emma Gonzalez who can give an amazing speech and say, it's all BS. And that, in fact, what's affecting this debate is the greed of the NRA and members of Congress who just want to be supported. Um, financially and politically by a, uh, an advocacy group that only cares about making money. It's literally all about money to have a young teenager show up at the town hall for Marco Rubio and say, will you stop taking money for the NRA? And Marco not having the courage to say yes. That is changing everything. It certainly changed everything for me because there was no way I was going to leave that opportunity to meet that family and those kids without having a different answer, without saying, I will stand up to the NRA. I will do what it takes to end gun violence. I will support universal background checks. I will make sure there's no uh, trafficking of guns into our communities. I will work to ban the assault weapons. I will work to ban the military style clips. I will work to make sure people who are gravely mentally ill and have violent backgrounds never get access to weapons. And so that's how it happened. And it was not an evolution. It didn't take a lot of time. It was that moment looking into a mom's eyes who lost her daughter. Do you see any daylight among your colleagues on this issue? I mean, the conversations that are happening right now specifically are around raising the age with you, at which you can purchase an assault rifle, uh, questions around large capacity magazines, whether they should be banned. Do you, I mean, you've been to this rodeo before. Is this just going to be another conversation, or is there, could there be movement? I think these kids are uh, inflaming uh, an extraordinary moment in our history. I think they are so strong and so passionate and so emotional that they're, they're waking people up. Like, people's hearts are hardened. You know, the biggest problem in Washington isn't the lack of bipartisanship. The biggest problem in Washington is the lack of empathy. And when you have a teenager look you in the eye and say, how dare you care more about money than me, I think they win. I really believe they're going to bring people into this debate who have turned a blind eye, who have felt comfortable doing nothing. I think they're going to inflame women. I think women are going to look at this issue. When guns becomes a woman's issue, that is when everything changes. Because there are moms and grandmoms and sisters in every part of this country, red states, blue states, conservative, liberal, who know it's wrong to have an 18-year-old be able to buy an AR-15 easily. You know morally that is an outrage. You know morally it is an outrage that states will not update their databases that prohibit terrorists mentally ill people, violent felons from getting weapons. You know that it's morally wrong that you can buy any weapon you want on the internet today regardless if you're qualified to own it. You know it's wrong. And so I believe that women will have the moral courage in all states, in all districts to vote on this issue because they know these kids are right. Well. Speaking of motherhood, uh, I'm the mother of a toddler, and I look at women in positions like yours, and there are devastatingly few of them, and I wonder how the hell do they do it? 
Uh, I want to know what it's like or what it was like being a new mom in Congress and, and how that guided any of your thinking on family leave or equal pay. There's some amazing story that I would love for you to tell about you got assigned like some block where you had to be on the floor between 5 and 7 p.m. And that was like right during the, the story. bedtime, I'll bath time, story. rigmarole. More than that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so when I got appointed to the U.S. Senate, um, it was when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State. Uh, and then I had to run a year and a half later at a special election and then ran two years later to have the full term and now I'm up again at 18. So that's my sort of Senate career. Um, but when I was appointed, I had a six month old. Uh, Henry was six months. I'd, I'd had, he was my second child. I had him as a member of Congress, which is a whole other set of stories. I mean, <laughs> I can't tell you how men in Congress feel it's okay to touch your stomach when you're pregnant. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Not just in Congress. Um, yeah. yeah, it's not okay. It's just stay away. Uh, and make lots of terrible jokes, like really inappropriate. Um, separate issue. So in the Senate, um, in the Senate, uh, so they, when you're a freshman senator, one of your jobs, if you're in the majority, is you have to preside. And it means you sit at the desk in the front of the Senate um, chamber where you vote, and you listen to the debate and you do any parliamentary ruling that you have to do. So that's your job. And as a junior senator, you get, you basically have to do it for a few hours every week. And so they told me that my time slot was from five to seven on weeknights. And I said, I, I can't do that because I was nursing. And any mother who's nursed a child knows that when you set your nursing schedule, you need <laughs> to nurse at that time. Like there's literally no option. You're either pumping or nursing, but you're gonna be doing something at that time. <laughs> And so this was the time that I always fed Henry. I fed him at six months out. I fed him in the morning before I left for work. And then I fed him when I came home at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. And then I fed him one time before bed. So that was my nursing schedule. And you can't change your nursing schedule. Like your I, just. So I'm trying to explain this to a young male staffer who does not have a wife yet and who's never had a child. And he's just being very mean. And he's like, nope, sorry, that's your slot. Not, not going to change it. So of course, I had to take it into my own hands. And I went and just talked to my colleagues and just talked to some amazing male colleagues and said, would you please take this slot? And I'll take your slot later at night or your slot in the day. And I found a wonderful senator, Mark Udall, who gave me his time slot. And I gave him mine. And it was all solved. But there is a lot of sexism in lots of industries. And this is a perfect example of how they just can't see these issues from our perspective. Um, even in the Senate today, you can't bring a child on the Senate floor. And when you have a child who's under five, you can't leave them in the hall. Like, like honey, just stand right there. I'll be right back. <laughs> no, they go. Like, they're not going to wait for you. Like, they're little. And so um, I had to vote when I had my um, toddler and Henry. I had to vote from the door because I had to, like, lean in and say, I, because I'm watching my kids <laughs> if the vote happened to be after pickup but before um, – uh, before I could get a sitter, and so just, they don't care. It's terrible. Well, how anyway. is that? Yeah, how does that? How has all of this guided your thinking? Obviously, on women so, who are not in Congress. So it makes yeah. me empathize right. very deeply with the struggles that pa parents face. I, I do not have the same struggles as most people because in my job I have enormous flexibility. Like I do not have to be that line worker or that low wage employer that gets no sick days and no vacation days. She doesn't have a choice. She's working two jobs, trying to get the hours. You know, her life is difficult. Um, mine is not compared to hers, but I know what she needs. I know that she needs she needs universal pre-K because that one year uh, of schooling makes a huge difference for her child, and she can be at work. She needs affordable daycare. Most parents do not have affordable daycare. If you're a low-wage worker and make fifteen thousand dollars a year, I'm sure Texas is like New York. It's ten k a year for daycare. It's not cheap, and if you don't have access to that quality early childhood education, your kid's going to be left behind. Uh, I know that she needs a living wage. I know that uh, $15 is a minimum to just have a living wage. And it's not even that great. I mean, it's really not where we need to be. And I know we need to get rid of the tipped wage because there's too many employers who steal her money. So I know what she needs. And I also know we need paid leave in this country. We're literally the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have paid leave. When you don't have paid leave, what it means is every time there's a life event of your family member, whether it's a dying parent, whether it's a sick spouse, whether it's an ill child, or whether it's a new baby, if your employer is not a good employer and gives you no sick days, no vacation days, no ability to have leave, you might have to quit your job to just meet the needs of that infant or that dying parent. And when you quit the job, it means you start over on the bottom rung. And we call it the sticky floor. You never get off that sticky floor. It's why, one of the many reasons why, two-thirds of minimum wage workers are women, because they can't get off the sticky floor. 
So what it allows me to do is understand her life a little better and fight for her because she needs a voice in Congress and she's not a powerful lobbyist. She's not a wealthy donor. She's, she's just a person who just needs a little bit of support to reach her full potential in the economy. And I know that if I can get her working to her full potential in the economy, that America's economy can grow. Because not until she can reach her full potential can America reach hers. And it's absolutely related. So it just gives me the passion and determination to change the infrastructure around rewarding work in this country, around what it means to be a, 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 you know, actually working to your fullest, to your full potential. And those structural changes, unfortunately, the men in Congress don't see the need because they don't live it. They haven't seen it. They didn't drop a kid off at daycare. They don't know why it's so important. So given that, what do you think the chances are for your legislation for the Family Act? So I'm optimistic because it is uh, becoming a popular topic, which is really a good start. My goal four years ago was to get it debated in the presidential. It's my only goal, just to make it enough of a national story that the presidential candidates would be asked, where do you stand on paid leave? Well, we had uh, Democratic candidates both supporting paid leave. We had two Republican candidates support paid leave. Our president now says he supports paid leave. What does that mean? I don't know. Not very good. But he at least says he does. Ivanka. Uh, Ivanka says it. she right. supports it. But again, moving them to, to a real paid leave bill is the goal. Because it's not just about babies, and it's not just about women. If you can't have that time to buy into an earned benefit, you need to buy into this. It needs to be yours, like Social Security that you own, that is there when you need it. If everyone had the ability to buy into pay leave, like an insurance plan, or like an earned benefit, like Social Security, I promise you we would all have it, and it wouldn't cost a lot. And I've done the number crunching, and it actually costs $2 a week. It's the cost of a cup of coffee a week for you to put aside and your employer to match. That's $104 a year. That is not a lot of money. But if every worker bought in, we would have national pay leave. It is a no-brainer. So I'm making the case. The fact that people are talking about it's helpful. I will get a Republican sooner than later. <laughs> and once we make this a bipartisan bill, sky's the limit. We can actually get a vote on it. We can make it something that is accessible to everybody. So talk about it. If you want paid leave, make sure your Republican members in the House and the Senate support this. It makes sense. All right. Well, I did a lot of reading about you to prepare for this interview, and I want to ask you a question. For any woman that finds herself on center stage, like you have, one of the downsides is this sort of public obsession with body image, yeah. and, and in particular, weight loss stories. And I kept reading. In researching, I routinely wanted to like punch these reporters who are writing these stories, asking you how many almonds you ate for a snack, and whether you were keeping yourself attractive. Not more than 15. Right, and keeping yourself attractive for your, quote, younger husband. I saw that over again. Oh my god, and over I again. forgot about that quote. Yes. So, <laughs> I want to know what. How do you <laughs> grapple with this? How do you, you know, feed that beast or not feed that beast? I mean, what is it like being a woman right. on center stage with those issues? So, so in my book, Off the Sidelines, Chapter Eight is about appearance, and mm -hmm. the reason why I wrote that chapter is because I wanted women everywhere to know that they're not alone, that that they are going to be judged by how they look in a way that is not fair and not right, and they need to be able to push past that. And it's important because in politics, for example, when you talk about a woman's looks, it undermines her. So one of the best techniques for uh, some of my opponents to try to undermine me was to talk about my looks, positive or negative. So my first house race in a two to one Republican district in upstate New York, uh, my opponent said she's just a pretty face. Again, trying to demean me, trying to undermine me, saying that I'm not smart or not capable. Um, but then he also then used the worst photo he could find on a mailer that he put in black and white and then put a wash of green over it. So I looked like this crazed woman because it was a windy day and my hair was blowing. And I, so again, talking about appearance is intended to undermine you. But I included stories about what it happens in the workplace. And so one example I gave was when I was a young lawyer at a big firm uh, in New York City. I'd been working really hard in a case. And we, the lawyers were getting together for a celebratory dinner. And my boss got up and started giving a toast to everybody. And he went through each person. And he looks at me and he says, oh, and thanks, Kirsten, thanks to Kirsten for all her hard work. She's put in so much time. And don't you just love her new haircut? Doesn't it look fabulous? <laughs> and I was like, oh my god. Like, after all that work, after all that effort, you could literally only talk about my haircut. I nearly fell off my chair. The good news for me at the moment was the people in the room all knew me. They'd worked with me. They knew I was smart, knew I was a good lawyer. I didn't have to worry about my reputation. But if he had said that in front of partners who didn't know me, I promise you they wouldn't have thought I was a good lawyer. They would have thought, mm, yeah, she's around because she's cute, or some other demeaning assessment.
that undermines my abilities. And so the reason why I talk about it is because I want to make sure that young lawyer today, when her boss says something rude or inappropriate, um, knows I'm not going to be judged on this. This is not, you know, this is not going to be the platform on which I am going to rise. And someday I'm going to be his boss or at least run this company or start my own firm and I'm going to set the rules. To, so she knows it doesn't, she, she can get past it. And that's why I think it's important. Well, if life is this different for women, in, uh, difficult for women in the public eye, for mothers in office, what is the strategy for getting more women to run and win? Oh, you talked a little bit about off the sidelines, not just your book, but your Women in Politics Political Action Committee. Um, I've heard you say publicly that women, quote, can and will have at least half of the seats in Congress and 25 governorships. Uh, in Texas, for uh, context, no new woman has won a full term to Congress since 1996. So Texas is fighting back, and you've got 31 women running for Congress, which is extraordinary. Um, and I love every bit of it, and these women are amazing. Any women candidates in the room that just want to stand up and smile, please stand up. Please stand up. <laughs> so these are your women candidates, so please, um, please ch take a chance to get to know who they are, what they're running for, and give them money. Um, what, what money means in politics, just so you know, is the ability to communicate. Uh, so if you send her $5 or $10 or $100, what that means is she can buy some radio time. She can buy some television time. She can buy a mailer. Um, she can buy lawn signs. Um, five bucks for a lawn sign. So really, it helps her get her message out. And that's what this is about. It's about women being heard. Uh, so I think, I think it's happening. And, and, and as I started with, I think it has a lot to do with that we have a harasser in the White House who has more than a dozen allegations of sexual harassment and assault, and it's inflaming uh, the debate. And women are angry, and they don't feel represented right now, and they don't feel like their voice is being heard. And they might have a different view on whether uh, it's protecting uh, our transgender troops, or whether it's uh, protecting DACA kids, or whether it's clean air and clean water, or whether it's reproductive freedom, or anything. Like All these issues matter, and this White House, in many instances, are not supporting our core values. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask, you're a prominent advocate for choice. Not everyone in your party is welcoming to candidates and voters who are pro-life, but there are Democratic candidates on the ground here in Texas who are running in historically Republican districts. You know, they cringe when they see party leaders sort of nationalizing abortion and guns and immigration because they need those crossover votes. What do you say to those types of candidates? Obviously, you've been a candidate who is on the more moderate end of the spectrum. So uh, my view on candidates is you should always speak from your heart, and you should run on what you believe in, and not be afraid if something's seen as a liberal issue or not, because people will respect you for your views. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, when I ran for Congress in 2006 in my two-to-one re Republican district, one of the issues I ran on was Medicare for All. And you might say, well, that's such a liberal issue. How could you possibly run on that in a red district? Well, because I believe in it. And when I talked to my voters about why I believed in it, they said that makes sense. So for example, my view is I think the insurance companies are stealing all our money. I think they are only focused on profits. They're only focused on quarterly returns. They pay their CEOs millions of dollars. And that money should not be going to insurance companies as a middleman. It should be actually be going straight to health care for the care you need, for the medicine you need, for the doctors you need. I think we have to take on the drug companies, make them allow us to buy in bulk, um, stop spiking prices. There needs to be accountability and transparency. And so I ran on that issue. And I said, anybody should be able to buy in, into Medicare at a price they can afford, which will create competition in the system. It, it's a not-for-profit public option that actually works. My district loved that. And, and two to one Republican, they love that issue. So I would just urge Democrats to run on their values, even if they're perceived as liberal, because they will be respected. My personal view is I think women's rights to make decisions about their bodies is a civil right. I think it is a fundamental civil right. And no one should tell me uh, what my values are, what my beliefs are, or when I'm going to exercise them. I do not think that is the job of Congress. And I never will. And it doesn't matter what your religious beliefs are. Those are your beliefs. But why should anyone impose that belief on anyone else? We've believed in religious freedom our entire lives. This country was founded on religious freedom. And I think the choice debate is a civil rights issue. So I won't support candidates that don't believe in that civil rights issue, because I make my choice on those issues. And so I would just urge your Democrats to feel comfortable being for basic human rights basic civil liberties. 
And I don't think you have to run uh, in a conservative way to win conservative districts on a lot of these issues. I think as long as you fight for what you believe in, uh, that gives you the shot to, to represent them, regardless of, of what part you're in. Well, one of the biggest roadblocks to women winning is that powerful men tend to help political allies and donors and friends yes, who are do. mostly other men. Um, Houston is, is poised to not only break that streak, but to make history with the first ever Texas Latina in Congress with State Senator Sylvia Garcia's campaign. Uh, your leadership pack gave money to her. Your colleague from New York, Chuck Schumer, uh, publicly endorsed Garcia's rival, who's a prominent male Democratic donor who previously lived 80 miles away from the district. Have you all had words about that at all? Is that part of the problem? No, no <laughs> words, but I've made my choice. <laughs> all right, well, I want to ask, what, if anything, did Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016 reaffirm for you about the national landscape for women in politics? Well, you know, I, Hillary, personally, for me, has always been a role model and someone who's really paved the way for every woman candidate who's running today. And I really appreciate her because she has fought for women and girls her whole life. That has been her core. Uh, That's what she did as Secretary of State. She traveled to places around the world and shined lights at places that were helping women and girls and helping them survive rape, helping them survive war, and, and really shone a light on these issues as Secretary of State. As First Lady, she did the same thing. It was that speech in China when she gave that speech in Beijing that said women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. That got me off the sidelines. When she actually gave that speech, I paid attention because I was a, I was a woman who um, uh, was an Asian studies major in, at Dartmouth as a college kid. I learned to speak Chinese. I studied from doors, dorms in Beijing. Didn't you study abroad with Connie Britton? I did. She was right. my roommate in Beijing. Another Texas connection. Yeah, right. so Connie uh, and I um, went to school together. And so I was amazed that our first lady would be that bold to deliver that message from that place at that time. And it was what made me want to serve. And so I winded up um, going to my first political event as an adult. Um, I was very interested in politics as a kid. My grandmother <laughs> loved politics. And I, even when I was a young girl, I said I wanted to be a senator. Um, but I never got involved as an adult until Hillary. And so I remember going to my first political event. And she looked out into the room of 100 women very similar to this. And I'm sitting way in the back. And she said, decisions are being made every day in Washington. And if you are not part of those decisions and you don't like what they decide, you have no one to blame but yourself. And for whatever reason, I thought she was talking straight to me and that made me sweat. And I thought, oh no, she's telling me I have to run for office and I'm not ready. Um, but sure enough, from that moment forward, uh, within 10 years, I did run for Congress. Um, but it was really her leadership and her role model that, that gave me confidence that women can serve in public life, that they can make tough decisions and make them well and they can do these jobs. So I, I think what she's done is extraordinary. And win or lose, uh, she showed the world uh, what women's leadership looks like at the highest echelons of power. Well, yeah. So you said that as a young girl, you thought, I want to be senator. Mm -hmm. As a young girl, did you think, I want to be president? I, 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 even I was not that bold. Um, but uh, I think there are girls today who are saying, I want to be president someday. I mean, I think that is literally the generational difference. I think they can see it and imagine it. And Hillary worked so hard and was tufted out so effectively that I think they can imagine it. And um, so I'm very grateful for her for that. So, but well, for you me, know where I'm going yes, here. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> Thank you. Good question, pivot. Question asked, right. uh, answer is, um, I'm really focused on 18, of course, um, because I do want to be U.S. Senator. I really, really am grateful to get to serve in the U.S. Senate. I love that job, and so I'm running for re-election at 18, hoping to serve another six years. And, um, but I do think the question for 20 will be some that folks will look at uh, in 19 and 20, and I think the Democrats will have amazing candidates. I think it'll be an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, to see uh, new ideas and, and something that's real. So, Well, there was speculation about you as early as 2016. Did you consider running for president in that cycle? So I've, I've decided I really want to run for Senate, and so that's where I'm focused, and I'm going to do my best to get elected. And All right, last try. If your party, if your party called on you to run, would you run? Yeah, well, it, when that happens, you can ask me. All right, okay. <laughs> sounds good. I'm hoping that I'll be your first call. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to open this up to questions in just a couple of minutes, so please get ready. And remember, when we do that, please raise your hand and wait for the mic so that everybody can hear your questions. Um, across the political spectrum, men in power are being held accountable for their actions against women, but not our president. 
Um, do you believe all of Trump's accusers? Do you think your colleagues in Washington do? And if so, why isn't there any, any action? Done. So I, you know, I haven't met them all, obviously, and I don't know all the stories. But when I've seen them talk on the television, and they did a wonderful video where several of them stood up and told their stories, I believe them. I, I do. I believe them. Women don't. False reporting and sexual assault and sexual harassment is so low. It's it's two to five percent of the time. We don't have a rash of false reporting in this country. What we have is a rash of sexual violence and no accountability and no justice. That is where our challenge lies. So. I believe women, and I believe these women, and I believe that they are trying to speak truth to power as best they possibly can. I think these allegations are credible. I think President Trump, of course, should resign. I don't think he's ever going to do that. But I do think it's, obligation, it's the obligation of the House of Representatives and the Senate, the Republican leadership in this country, to hold hearings. And it's outrageous that there's been no hearings, that there's been no process and no ability to uh, to give these women one measure of justice, not just even being heard. And so I will continue to call out my Republican colleagues to hold hearings. But when we flip the House in 18, which I do believe is going to happen because of all the awesome women in Texas who are running, um, I believe we will flip the House right through Texas. And I believe that then we can have transparency and accountability. So I do think it will happen. Um, but again, we need to make sure that all women can be safe and that they have an ability to get justice, to have um, this opportunity to be heard, and certainly not happening in the highest places of America today. So we just need to push back. Right. All right, well, we're going to open it up to Q&A. I have to get the senator out of here in a quick 15 minutes to catch an airplane. So yes, where is the mic? Here we go. If you've got a question and you're close to the mic, you get to go oh, first. Good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and make sure that these are questions, not speeches, oh, please. They're not speeches Great. at all. I don't know which question to ask. You get to pick. If you don't run, what do you think about Cory Booker? And the other thing is <laughs> Warren Buffett and uh, Amazon folks and Chase have a health plan. I don't know a whole lot about it, but does it make sense to you? So um, the Amazon, so I love Cory Booker. He's one of my best friends in the Senate. I think he's awesome. I hope he does whatever he wants to do, and I hope he's successful because he's awesome. So Corey's terrific, as are so many of our Senate colleagues. And when you do hear those 20 lists, you know, for people considering running or being pitched to run, they're all awesome. Like, we have some amazing public servants in our party who, who will serve and will make a difference. Um, in terms of the uh, pooling of uh, the, what they're trying to do is create economies of scale so they can get lower prices. Um, fair enough. But if they go through an insurance provider, they're still going to pay more than they need to pay. So ultimately, we should really be fighting for a uh, public option uh, for some version of single payer, some version of middle, uh, Medicare for all, because that is the difference. I'm telling you, it is the difference. Because when money that you pay goes directly to the doctor or the hospital or, or the medicines, it's just cheaper. Like it, If you're ever going to bend the cost curve, you've got to get the middleman out of this. So I think it's just a, a short term fix for themselves and their employees, but it's not the answer. I mean, we really need at least one not-for-profit public option to drive real competition and get this infrastructure cost out. The mic's right here. Yes. Senator Gillibrand, my name is Amy Augenbaum. I'm an employee of Communities Foundation, and we are so lucky to be in this room with you, so thank you for coming today. Um, so uh, Emily Ramshaw did a wonderful job hitting on several hot topics. I'm going to uh, dive deeper on one, if you'll oblige me. Uh, reproductive uh, health care and reproductive rights. Um, so that is not necessarily a partisan issue, as you alluded to. And my understanding, although I can't, I'm too young to remember it, is that it didn't used to be a partisan issue. Right. Because I, I believe it's ultimately about access to healthier choices, healthier women, families. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, especially in a state like Texas that has particularly impacted this, it's an economic issue. Yeah. So I'd love to hear your opinion on how we can communicate around that on that issue, rather than where the conversation, I feel, typically goes, which is much more divisive and much more personally challenging. Right. So I think reproductive care is a health it, it's a healthcare issue, but it's an economic issue too. Um, women need to be able to get access to basic health care at all stages of their lives. And this demonization of Planned Parenthood is problematic because many people, men and women, get some primary care from Planned Parenthood. Uh, they might get uh, cancer screenings. They might get breast exams. They might get uh, basic birth control. And when you make it hard for women to get health care, affordable health care, you're going to have uh, very, very challenging, horrible consequences. Um, 
preventing unwanted pregnancies is one of the best ways to reduce abortion in this country. So they're, they're working cross purposes to their goals, which is stupid. And so we just need to fight harder to make sure this debate is about access to basic care and not about demonization of women. Um, and, and that's what we're up against. It's, it's a demonization and uh, judgmentalism that is not consistent with our values as a country. It's just not consistent. Hello, my name is Ruby Faye Woolridge, and I'm running for Congress to replace Joe Barton, but that's not the question. That's not the question. This is my question. The Texas House and Senate has passed a bill that will force women who've been uh, raped to buy rape insurance, trying to prevent them oh from getting an God. abortion. What are your thoughts on that? And I must get a picture before you leave. I'm ready. So they ha they're asking women to buy rape insurance? That's outrageous. It's outrageous. That's, that's not my personal understanding of how the legislation works. What does it say? It's, it's around um, if you can have abortions covered uh, by your insurance if you're the victim of rape or domestic violence. Yep. And, and the only thing that's right. stopping it is that the government is not trying to pass both houses, mm -hmm. so it's just a matter of time. It's specifically for reproductive, it's specifically for abortion. Mm. Yep. But uh, there are all kinds of legislation in Texas that are, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people raise questions about, yeah. Yep. That yep. is a lot of victim blaming. Yep. Where's the mic out there? Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Latandra. I'm a student at Paul Quinn. I just have a question about, um, I was recently uh, informed that I did not qualify for a position because I have children. And I'm wondering if I should question that or... Hire a lawyer? Yes, you should. <laughs> there's a lot of good trial lawyers in Texas. I, I, I bet there's some in the room. That is outrageous. That's illegal. That is absolutely illegal. So if there's any lawyers in the room that want to give her your card, raise your hand, please, so she knows where to walk. Please help her. That's outrageous. That's not right. Um, and that's why we need women in Congress, because we have to pass laws that can protect you and protect people in the workplace from harassment and being denied jobs. Um, there's a lot of problems with gender bias and racism throughout society, and we have to write the laws to protect against it. And I'm sorry that you're getting hit uh, for that. It's not right. It's not right at all. Good afternoon. My name is Amber Holmes Turner, and I'm also a sophomore at Paul Quinn College. I have a question. I have a 13-year-old son. And he came up to me a couple of days ago. He's like, Mom, I'm afraid to go to school. And I said, Dante, why are you afraid to go to school? He says, because I don't want to die. I don't want to have to send my son to school. In a, and I actually Googled bulletproof backpacks and bulletproof vests. What kind of confidence can the Senate give us as parents? Um, because I don't want to bury my child. And I don't want, because I have to send him to school. And President Trump, made a comment about teachers being armed. That's not the problem. The problem is them even getting into the school. Agreed. So is there something that's going to change? Because like, I don't, and I, and I mean this in all honesty, I don't want to become that parent because if something ever happens to mine, I'm the wrong parent. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean that. Yeah. And, my and, voice I, and I think yeah. your anger about this issue and your fear for your child and your child's fear is going to be what changes this debate. And I hope you use every opportunity you have to speak out. And to the extent you have a member of Congress who supports the NRA and supports the gun lobby and won't take and keeps taking their money, I think we need a, 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 a movement to call out every member of Congress who takes NRA money and who wants NRA support. And I, I think you could make it viral here in Texas um, by doing a hashtag you know, issue about this specifically. And I would support these, all these women who are running. Like we, we can help them. And we can help them by using our social media access to let our friends and family know who to support and why. But make this the issue of 2018 and don't let it go. Just hold every member accountable of Congress accountable who does not support common sense gun reform, period. And, and just channel that anger into activism. And you know, put the lawn sign out. Go door to door. Make some phone calls. Do whatever it takes to just flip that house seat so that you have people who represent you and protect your son. Hello, Senator. I'm Favaz. I'm a junior at UT Dallas. 
if uh, our boy Beto wins here and we flip the Senate, what would you like to see, because we would be in the majority as the Democrats, uh, more family-friendly legislation regarding the Senate rules if we happen to be the majority? Uh, making the Senate a better place to work? Yeah. Well, I'd pass my anti-harassment bill immediately. Um, I think it's really important that we protect interns, staff members, people who work every day in government from bosses who harass or assault them. So that would be my, my first absolute priority. Um, and then just elect more women, because once you elect 51% of women in Congress, things are going to change. Uh, you won't just be debating paid leave, you'll be passing paid leave. Uh, you wouldn't be denying a woman's right to get access to birth control and health care. Um, you'd be talking about the whole range of economic issues that affect families, uh, not just um, trying to deny them the decision to make reproductive choices. Like, literally everything changes when we have 51% of women in Congress. And so my goal is to just keep pushing the best candidates and getting them elected so that our voices can actually be heard in Washington where they make the laws. Uh, Senator, I'm going out after this right away to get off the sidelines, and I'm sure this is in there. But how, what in your background, or how were you raised to be so courageous? Oh, I'm so excited about this question. So I'll tell you why I'm really excited about this question. I'm writing a children's book on that topic. I'm writing a children's book on the history of suffrage. And I've, got, uh, I've read tons of biographies about the women who did this great work 100 years ago. It's 100 years from the time we got the right to vote in 2020. And so and it's all about, it's, it's about how did they build their ability to be courageous, what made them so bold, what made them so brave. And so I've really pulled out from these women's lives and thought about it myself. And so for myself, what made a difference is I had amazing role models. I had a mother who was absolutely fearless. My mother always did things differently since the time she was little. When she was in college, she was on the fencing team. She was on the rifle team. She wrote for the uh, college newspaper as a sports writer. She wasn't allowed into the press boxes at hockey games, but that didn't stop her. She went to law school. She was only one of only three women in her law school class. By the time she was my age, she was a second degree black belt. Like she was doing things a lot when she was young and she never was afraid. So she taught me to never be afraid to be different, never be afraid to have a different ambition than somebody else. And her mother was also extraordinary. Her mother never went to college, was a secretary in the state legislature. But 75 years ago, she knew that even while all the men were legislators and all the women were support staff, that they could actually have a voice. And so the way she made that happen was she organized the women. And she said, let's work on campaigns together. And so she got these women to do the door to door, to stuff the envelopes, to get active in politics, to amplify their voices that way. So from her, I learned um, how to be bold and actually how to recognize that women matter, that our voices matter, that what we do with our time matters. And so uh, both my mother and my grandmother really did provide me that extraordinary role model to not be afraid to do things differently, to not be afraid to be out there when no one else is there. Uh, to know that my voice is important, to know that the voice of all women are important, and that's really propelled me to want to serve. And my grandmother's uh, life is what, you know, she loved public service. She, she just thrived in it. She thought that what you do uh, within your community as an elected leader can transform anything, and so I know that's true. And so I want to use my job to help people too, because my grandmother taught me that that's what you can do. And so role models, and, and all of us can be those role models. Every single person here, male or female, we can mentor somebody in our office, some woman who's a few years younger, some woman of a different generation, to say, these are the things I learned, and let me help you get from A to B. I try to do that with candidates. I just met with one of our candidates right now, Lillian, who's running, um, about ideas about what have I learned in, in, in public life? What did I learn how to be a strong candidate? How do you, you know, ask people for support? And so we can all pass it down, and that's the power of women. Uh, we're, we're really good at mentoring and providing role models for each other. So one more back here. Thank you, Rebecca. We'll make this the last one because the senator's selfie game is strong and there are a lot of you here who want to get in on it. So I wish Susan and I would have switched because that would have been a better question to <laughs> end on. It was such a great answer. Um, you mentioned your legislation saying that um, if it were to pass that it wouldn't allow taxpayer um, dollars to go towards, um, you know, Paying. sexual yeah. harassment mm -hmm. cases. Does that include um, campaign funds as well or just taxpayer dollars? So right now, it is paid by taxpayer dollars. It would be illegal to use your campaign money to pay a settlement of sexual harassment. You have to use campaign money in campaign-related events, and harassing girls is not part of your campaign. So that would already be illegal. So yeah, they, you, you cannot. You have to use your own money. 
Um, and I think that's the best part of the bill because you need transparency and accountability. So I could probably take about 50 selfies really fast but if you line up and if you just really do it super fast. So if, if you um, line up here and exit that way, line up here, oh, that, yep. and then exit that way, we can just boom, 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 Before boom. Before you do that, please join me in thanking the senator for being here with us today. Yep. All right, y'all.